She's going to read you a little bit from her book, and then we'll do a little interview and sure. get to know her. Okay. And this so is you us. Can ask questions. <laughs> Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, let, let me just give you the context, uh, if I may, of the chapter that I'm going to read. Uh, this uh, chapter is sort of midway through the book, and I think it's a very special one, which is why I selected it. Um, Sarah is the protagonist, and she is in a cabin halfway up Mount Kenya with her husband, Peter, and her uh, Machiavellian uh, safari guide, who is Max. <laughs> now, just by coincidence, a world-famous photographer and his daughter have been stranded there, but he has a lecture he has to give, so Max, who's a pilot, flies him down to the uh, Mount Kenya Safari Club. So, here we go. <clears throat> Peter, that's the husband, busies himself with mixing drinks. Max is in the kitchen pantry cleaning the catch and instructing the Maasai how to prepare it while Thad and Julia slump heavily down on the couch um, to catch their breath from the laughter and the fast paced hike, hike back to the cabin. I'm interviewing the girls, Sarah says, and introduces everyone. She is about to ask Ella to continue when the door is hurled open and a bracing wind blasts through the cabin. Everything comes to a halt as the force enters, creating a thunderclap just inside the cabin's entrance. The explosion is Brandon Howard. By God, it's damn cold out there. Hello, everyone. Someone flew me back and I've been hiking in the dark to get here. Brandon stands loosely at ease with himself. He removes his jacket and with one hand, gesturing bandage greeting with the other. He looks at Sarah, trying to place her, not recognizing her from the encounter on the trail hours earlier. She was a mess then, now she is not. Didn't we recently meet? Not formally, my name is Sarah. Max introduces everyone else. Peter, that's the husband offers to make Brandon a drink, but Brandon moves knowingly to the separate parts of the cabin, collecting the glass and the ingredients from his drink from different niches. While he does so, Sarah forces herself to turn back to his daughter. Her eyes didn't really want to leave Brandon, but <laughs> my father is a very well-known photographer. He's done lots and lots of books and exhibits. He's always quite busy, and we're just now getting to spend a little time together because I've been living in England with my mother and um, since they separated. But father does some lecturing once in a while, only on circum very special circumstances like this evening. Okay, everyone, let's sit down for dinner. Max is back at the helm. The table is covered with a red checkered tablecloth. A lantern spotlights dark purple beet soup served in large pottery coffee mugs. Bottles of South African and French wine appear from one bag of Max's culinary packages prepared for him by his cook in Nairobi. Brandon, Max begins a toast, here's to an absolutely unbelievable chance encounter with someone I've always wanted to meet. We're going to celebrate this good fortune with a pretty decent meal including the fresh trout we caught at Lake Alice. Max is as radiant as a man can permit himself to be. He leans forward to watch Brandon and grasp his every word, struggling to keep his enthusiasm in check. Brandon explains that the lake is stocked, then digresses to how things run in Kenya, as if it is a natural progression everyone should follow. Sarah, too, leans forward, her gaze fixed on the far right side of the table. Brandon, she realizes, is blessed with superior good looks, his comfortable style suggesting he has enjoyed his advantageous appearance from an early age. Though soiled and exhausted, his sophistication is unaffected. He is a man of the world who walks through life with an ease bordering on sheer indifference. Sarah suspects that underneath this persona, he is a calculating creature for no career can depend on the vagaries of luck alone. Her own experience in the business world has taught her that much. 
Sarah is undeniably fascinated with him, and when coupled with the extraordinary circumstances of his being here, the compulsion to write once again overwhelms her. She reaches for her journal from beneath the table and registers pieces of Brandon's speech, which he underscores with his long arms. As whites are replaced and blacks take over, the judiciary will become more lenient, Sarah catches him saying. Magic pervades this evening. Nothing like this will ever occur again, not even in her fondest recollections or most vivid dreams. And so she writes, candles and hurricane lamps flicker brightly upon the rough hewn log of the cabin sheltering us this night. Residual light illuminates the functional interior and provides a glow highlighting the intrigue of the activity within. Two dark, elongated maasai, cloaked in blood-red shukas, move rhythmically toward the fireplace, throwing shadows on surfaces as they kneel before the coals to cook each course of our evening's meal. Like lanky puppets, they approach our table, ebony arms extended in a gigantic vertical reach of service. Taut faces display thick lips, which curve slightly upward in visible satisfaction of their culinary efforts. Piercing the fragility of this primitive scene, Max leans in front of Peter and angrily whispers, whispers another of his terse directives. Sarah, stop writing. Put away that damn journal. Do you realize who's talking? Peter sighs, not reproaching Max even now. Ella's eyes widen in astonishment at Max's rudeness. For Sarah, there is paralysis. What an improbable place for a second nervous breakdown, she thinks to herself. The journal in her lap lies open, its purple page dissected in two halves. The comments of Brandon reserved for one side and Sarah's description of the evening on the other. It is imperative to hold myself together, she counsels herself. She shuts the diary, placing it at her feet, and grinds it with her heel into the cold floor. At the far end of the table, Brandon skips neither a beat nor an English-accented word. He remains engaged in an animated description of his life and the politics of Kenya. He has not, Sarah believes, witnessed her numbing humiliation. All the while outside the cabin, a cold wind blows across the high desert, ruffling everything in its path. Blow as it will, its gusts are incapable of rearranging the stars embedded in the African sky. Despite the swells of anger rising within her, Sarah studies the tribal tableau from her seat on the makeshift, makeshift, makeshift dinner table. I'm sorry. She is swept up into an ancestral deja vu as her mind wanders. This is our cave, she imagines. Over there, the flints that provide the light, and there, the fire for heating our food and providing our warmth. In the corner, standing tall, are the hunter-gatherers who have prepared our evening meal, and here am I, on safari, experiencing this magical, exquisite night over 11,000 feet up Mount Kenya. Glancing again at Brandon, who is still telling stories of politics, photographs, and narrow escapes, she wonders, why does this all feel so familiar, so comfortable, so natural? Then Sarah remembers a brilliantly insightful two-word phrase she once read by Dr. Richard Leakey, genetic imprint, and in a rare, rare moment of certainty and equanimity, she realizes, oh yes, I'm home. Brandon eats like a man breaking a fast and drinks with the thirst of a parched desert receiving the season's first rain. His dynamic presentation about everything Kenyan continues, including its policies, its conservation efforts, tourism, agriculture, imports and exports. He opines, answers questions, toasts, and thanks everyone profusely for their hospitality. Max hangs on Brandon's every word. Sarah is spellbound, never having experienced the hypnotic effect of someone whose voice gives a verbal serenade while describing so many different subjects. God, what a day, Brandon concludes. I was up at 5.30 this morning trying to start the van. Of course, I haven't the faintest bloody idea what's gone wrong. I have to get my mechanic up here tomorrow to take a look at it. He'll manage to sort it all out with the proper spanner. 
The Maasai began to clear the table. Max asked the two attendants to bring coffee, tea, hot milk, and sugar. Brand directs them in Swahili to move the requested beverages to a position at the end of the long table closer to the file. fire. The girls huddle together on the sooty hearth, sipping tea and yielding the couch to others, each of them imbibing strong coffee mellowed by cognac. Brandon is in constant motion, acting with all the familiarity of a lord moving about his favorite manner. Sarah is tentatively atop the arm of one of the old chairs. Overshadowing everything, Sarah takes note, is Brandon's ebullience, which openly challenges any of the day's events to bedevil his good humor. This is a quality unknown to Sarah in any man before tonight, a quality drawing her closer to him and closer still. Max stands with his coffee cup in one hand, waving it slightly as he talks. What happened to your hand? It was grazed by a charging rhino, of all things. I was trying for a particularly close shot. Damn unfortunate, but it's just one of many near disasters. No real harm done. Where would you like to travel to next, Brandon? Peter wants to know, intrigued by this man of high profile who appears impervious to fear. Well, actually, I would love to travel amongst the Turing nomads with 2,000 camels crossing the Sahara. They fight their way through the borders, you know. They're smugglers. smugglers. They smuggle mira, a sap from trees making incense. They're beautiful people, actually. Um, imagine it, three to four hundred camel trains at a time moving across the desert. One would negotiate their way through the entire experience. It tests a man, it really does. I drink my camel's milk and sleep on the ground. It would be absolutely marvelous, I think. He looks into the fire. Brandon's uh, interest no longer can be sustained by entertaining the group. He glances about as if bored with questions he has so often been asked, not wanting to go into the realm of his fame and notoriety, and perhaps hoping to circumvent curiosity about his techniques for acquiring the more controversial animals he has captured on film. Brandon studies Sarah and after some reflection roars out an alarm over the fact that she is not drinking something warm. He pours a cup of tea and hands it to her. The cup dances nervously upon the saucer, evidence of her shaking hands. Now, Sarah, come over here to the table. I'm going to give you an interview because I did notice you were asked to put your notepad down during dinner. There is stillness, interrupted only by the sound of Sarah's ceramic cup jumping slightly off the saucer. In this small spark of time, something is transmitted by Brandon to all those in the room, and whatever it is, Sarah realizes it is a turning point in her favor. Oh no, that's all right. I'm sure you're exhausted. You've been up since the crack of dawn. Crack of dawn. Nonsense. Up you go, he demands, reaching out to her until she is standing. He removes the teacup from Sarah's grip and sets it down, then leads her a few steps to the table as if it is she who is made of ceramic. They straddle the bench, facing each other, close enough to talk softly. Sarah listens intensely to the deafening silence. Well, have at it, Brandon directs her. Sarah shakes from her cropped hair to her hiking boots. Her pen bobs between her thumb and her forefinger without the requisite tension to write. I don't think I can do this right now. I'm sure it's been a bit brutal, but if I talk, will you calm down and write? <coughs> yes, I think I can do that much. Okay, he begins as if he has just convinced a fan to purchase one of his pricier photographs. Then let's have a go. Where do you want to start? I can talk about anything. Start wherever you're most comfortable. I suppose I'd like to know about Kenya, and for right now, about something other than the animals. Oh God, I'm sorry, that's your business, photographing animals. Don't give it a thought. First, I want to tell you about the land, because it's fundamental to understanding everything else. Kenyatta, our first president, set up a system to change the tribal, tribal lands right into a constitutional entitlement, giving farmers title to the land. This provided them with collateral to borrow against. To develop their crop, crops, the residents of the country became participants instead of spectators. Brandon continues talking excitedly, but Sarah ceases to write. Rather than recording his words, she allows them to soothe her. 